Hello, everyone. So welcome to the second uh, keynote of Berlin Buzzwords. It's my pleasure and honor to welcome Amanda Brock, who, among many other things, is the CEO of Open UK, the European representative of OIN, and also a member of the OASIS Open Projects Advisory Council. So without further ado, uh, Amanda, it's up to you. And she will talk about how we can use open source for good. Thanks, Deb. And thank you, everybody, for having me along this evening to keynote uh, Berlin Buzzwords. It's a real pleasure to be here with you. Um, I think Nina asked me, I can't remember if it was December or January, to come to Berlin and keynote. And originally, I was going to be keynoting on Monday morning. And uh, I have to say, I was pretty much looking forward to a weekend in Berlin, coming to the conference, hanging out with all of you guys. And uh, this was going to be the biggest week of my year. This was also going to be Open UK Week. And as Deb said, my main role in open source these days is that I am the CEO of Open UK. Um, I'm going to talk to you about Open for Good, but I'm going to start by giving you a bit of context about Open UK. I don't know if it's an organization many of you will have heard of. And Open UK has existed for a while, but really only sort of started to shine its light in the last six months. And we are an advocacy and industry organization across the UK for open source technology or open technology. And our vision is to develop and sustain UK leadership in open technology. Now, for many of you, you may not have heard those two words together, or if you have, you may have only heard them recently or not very often. And it's something that's definitely worth paying attention to because I think it's very much the future of open. And for us at Open UK, we've defined open technology and we've defined it as open source software, open hardware and open data. And of course, at this point in time of innovation and development, bringing those three together is critical. I think we're probably the first organization to formalize that in our vision, but I, I also believe that you will see many more organizations doing something similar. And we, we create that vision as a reality using th three key areas, three, cre uh, three pillars of open. And those are community, legal and policy, and education. And I'm just gonna talk a little bit about what each of those mean for us. So in terms of community, we're trying to build a really visible and loud open community across the UK. And uh, what we found, unsurprisingly, and you probably see this in your own geographic areas, is that we're not necessarily terribly joined up by geography within the open communities. Most of us, if you're anything like me or the people I know, will have worked in projects where we really enjoy the international collaborations that we do and we work with people all over the globe and that's important to us. And of course that should never change. But what we've discovered is that often people work on projects and know their um, colleagues on those projects but may not know their neighbours. Uh, lockdown has been a revelation for me in the UK and I've discovered that uh, a lady at Microsoft who I, I've actually been working with in an open data project lives across the street from me, literally 100 yards from me, and we've become firm friends through lockdown. So what we want to do is build, build this community as a strong, visible, loud community across the UK by engaging people and engaging them in events, in our digital interactions, through different projects. And one way we were going to do that was hosting Open UK Week, which was to take place, as I said, this week. I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but it's now moved to October. And like uh, Berlin Buzzwords, is mostly going to be online, if not entirely online. The second area, and we're actually very strong in this one in the UK, is legal and policy. And we want to make sure that the UK becomes a great place to do open. Um, we were really, really pleased that we were able to speak with the UK trade, international trade people back in February. Now, those people were um, negotiating and still are negotiating all the replacement treaties being put in place around the Brexit exit from Europe. So we were able to go and speak to them and advise them and guide them with respect to the use of source code provisions in those treaties as they would impact open source. 
Uh, we also review and monitor new legislation, currently still in Europe. Um, we, we're still there to the end of the year, but also primarily in the UK. And we're building engagements with UK government to try and work more and more on the, the policies and practices. And we've also established within that legal and policy group something called Future Leaders. And that's something you might be interested in. I think, again, we're the first to, to have created that anywhere in the globe. But what we've done is we've realized that we're all getting on a bit. So frankly, we have a bunch of people in this legal and policy group who are really established in open, but we're all in our 40s and 50s. And we need to make sure the next generation is gonna come through and carry on this work. No point in building something if it's not sustainable, right? So what we've done is engage with uh, legal and policy people, business people. We don't yet have developers, but we'd love to have some developers engage in it. And we are mentoring them and leading them through a review of UK government terms when it comes to procurement that will impact open. So CCS, GDS and the NHS terms across the UK. Um, we will produce a paper reviewing those, um, which will be written by the leaders of that future leaders group. And we will host a seminar probably with the Open Chain Project in the autumn with UK Gov. Um, that group needed some training. And most of the people involved know a bit about open, but they're learning and they want to learn more. So what we did was pull together a few training sessions that um, started, I think in April, uh, they're at noon every Friday, noon UK every Friday. Uh, you can get details of what's coming up on openuk.uk slash events. In our events calendar, you'll see them. They are presented by leaders, not just in the UK and Europe, but global leaders in the open movement. Um, we started with what you might expect, compliance, governance, patents, trademarks, the really practical things that would impact anybody with a support background around open. And we've just flipped as of this week into looking at some of the community topics. Uh, we start on Friday with Neil McGovern, who, as you probably know, is the executive director of the GNOME Foundation. Neil's talking about open in the desktop. We have Jonathan Riddle the next week from KDE talking about apps and open. And then the week after we have Matt um, Jarvis, talking about contribution to community projects. And that will go on picking up in hardware and data into the summer. Uh, we have a break in August and then we come back in September and we pivot to the commercials. So we talk about uh, business models. We have people you will know uh, like Frank Karlischek, um, uh from Nextcloud and uh, Rancher, Shane Coughlin from Open Chain talking about the business side of Open. Now, I mentioned those at a little bit more length than you maybe would expect me to in a talk about Open for Good, but I would encourage you to take a look. They're free to attend, anyone can attend, and they are available as recordings afterwards. Every time I watch one of them, I learn something new. So that's the second tranche. The second tranche is legal and policy, which sits with building our community. And then, of course, there's a third piece, which is education and learning. And we focus that across primary, secondary and tertiary education. We have a universities group who should this week have had a three day posse professors open source software education. That's a project run by Google and Red Hat in the US. They were coming to the UK to do uh, training for our professors. Unfortunately, I think that's probably a face-to-face -face event. We've pushed it provisionally back to October, could be next year. That group is also looking at a cross-student collaboration, um, entering a competition. And we then have a secondary school, so ages 11 to 18, where we're focusing on building a qualification, an educational exam qualification, possibly something we call a GCSE here, not definitely. We want to launch that by the end of 2022. It's all been stalled, unfortunately, with the pandemic. But that's something that's very dear to my heart, making sure that we're not just educating kids and how to learn a language, how to build in Python or for a little kid's scratch, but actually teach them what open means. And we're also aware that many of the best developers are not focused on the, the traditional educational routes. You know, they don't find doing GCSEs or whatever the exams conducive to their way of working. So we're working with a number of major companies and with uh, the education authorities to try to build um, a, an apprenticeship scheme where people will learn on the job hands on how to be an open engineer. 
And then I guess finally, we, we're looking at little kids. And with the little kids, we're engaging with a number of organisations who are currently providing code camps and the like to take them a step further and actually teach kids about what open means, not just the technologies. So um, one of the, the, the many, many events that were impacted or victim to the pandemic was the Open UK Kids Competition. Um, this is something I was very proud of and in fact, I feel like I sweated blood the first part of this year to get it in place. And then of course, along came coronavirus and off went my, my competition. Um, in short, it was a competition designed for kids to build this glove and then compete with each other, creating something that was uh, original and creative using the glove, uh, which is a software glove. Um, the glove was designed originally by the singer Imogen Heap, double Grammy award winning singer Imogen Heap about 10 years ago. I worked with Imogen on the prototype and there was always an intention that at least aspects of it would be open and that's what I was involved in. Um, the glove was picked up by Ariana Grande who toured about five years ago with it and last year this mini Moo glove, this kit was released. Now the, the glove is built, the kid's glove is built on a micro bit, a BBC micro bit. And that um, little board is used to power the musical capacity of the glove. The glove can be used for other things, but primarily it's an instrument. Um, I'm really excited to say that the glove has been open sourced as part of our project. And you, if you were to buy a kit, you would get all aspects, but you can now, if you happen to have a micro bit, download the instructions to build the glove, download the template to cut around your hand. And also, um, you I think you still have to buy the little speaker. I don't think there's any way of creating that, that little piece of hardware, but it's inexpensive. Now, the, the idea was that we were having kids competing in teams of four, each team sharing one glove kit that we would, thanks to Red Hat sponsorship, be giving the kids. And then we would bring um, winners to London this Thursday to have a, a code camp in the Red Hat Innovation Lab and then to compete uh, with Imogen Heap there to judge. Um, obviously, I cannot ask four kids to share a glove anymore. I don't think many of their parents would let me move them around the UK this year, let alone this week. So we had to let that go. But what we've done instead, not to be beaten by it, is create a uh, smaller course, uh, a smaller competition rather, and an additional course. So we have a competition taking place in September. Uh, the winners will be announced at the Open UK Awards. They're part of Open UK Week and they take place on the 20th of October. If any of you are in the UK or know folk in the UK, nominations have just been extended from, the, uh, from now to the 15th of June, right through to 30th June. So you can nominate people to participate uh, who, or to be considered for an award in open source software, hardware data as an individual or a young person. And then of course, there'll be a kids winner. And what we've done with the kids is not just have this smaller competition, but also we are giving each child their own gloves so they won't share. And we've sent those out to them over the last week or so. And we've developed a 10 session animated course on open. So the first session is animated by the singer Imogen Heap. Really brilliant. It looks wonderful. Um, and Imogen, of course, is fabulous, uh, very experienced in doing that kind of thing. But what I like best about it is that we're not just uh, teaching the kids how to make the glove. Imogen explains in the first episode what open source is. So we then have nine further episodes coming out weekly and each one explains an aspect of open source to the kids and helps their learning and development, as well as giving them a fun activity. Now that's currently been run in a closed environment for only the kids in the competition, but we plan over the summer vacation to bring that to a much broader group of kids. It's being released Creative Commons CC by SA, which will allow other organizations to talk to us, have the script, uh, translate it and have the course run in other languages too. So I hope I'll get the chance to work with maybe Nina and people in Germany and other countries on doing some translations and sharing for our kids. So the final thing I want to mention to you about Open UK is the Ditto project. And it's the first truly open for good project that I've mentioned today. Um, Ditto stands for Develop in the Open and the project is funded by Innovate UK. 
Now, this project has six hundred thousand uh, pounds of, of funding. A small part of that's going to Open UK, so that we can contribute around governance, um, legal, and policy. And we are working to to make the project open chain compliant. Uh, the project is producing an e op system, an e observation system for hospitals. And once that's created, it's something that will be able to scale at a low cost and be very interoperable across different health authorities in the UK and internationally. So well worth taking a look at. So how did a nice girl like me end up in a space like this? Well, uh, early in 2012, I had been a corporate, commercial and tech lawyer working in a number of big companies managing legal teams, developing legal teams. And I was asked if I would go to a company called Canonical in this slightly odd open source field that I'd heard of but didn't know much about um, for three months. And if I would go and help them scope what they would do with their legal team. And then I was gonna to move to Amazon to work on an electrical retail project that I assume would have been the Kindle. Uh, something very unexpected happened to me at Canonical, which was that I went in there to help them to build something, to be a lawyer, to create a legal environment. And I found very quickly that I'd found a real home, somewhere that I felt I belonged. And I really probably, uh, you could say I went native and I discovered that I belonged in this open source community. Now, for anyone who doesn't know Canonical, it's one of, if not the biggest open source company in Europe, headquartered in London, founded by Mark Shuttleworth. And it is the commercial sponsor of the open source operating system, Ubuntu. And when I started there, Ubuntu was the desktop of choice. And it was very much at the forefront of the open desktop for the development community. In the time that I was there, I was there five years. What we found was that it, it spread much, much broader and it became one of the underpinning technologies for client and platform. Uh, I'm quoting Simon Wardley here, but who was the director of cloud at the time at Canonical. And I think we were something like 78 or 76%, he says, of the cloud marketplace um, back in 2012. Now that hasn't necessarily changed a lot. And um, what we see is that open source software like uh, Ubuntu sits under almost all platform technology. And I'll come back to that later in the presentation. As I said, I have a number of roles. So as well as being CEO of Open UK, I'm a European representative of OIN, the Open Invention Network. Um, my involvement with OIN goes back to my days at Canonical. We made a conscious decision when I ran the legal team not to patent any of our technology or innovation. And instead, what we did was contribute financially to the infrastructure that builds OIN. Um, OIN is the world's biggest defensive intellectual property organization. Uh, it's probably not strictly open for good, but it does a lot of good. And it is a collaboration across organizations where every company person or organization who participates signs up to an agreement. That agreement says that if they hold patents, they will license those patents for free to everybody else in the group to the extent those patents read on a definition. That definition is called the Linux system definition, and it's a list of packages. And you'll find it on openinventionnetwork.com website. So everybody agrees the same contract. Nobody pays to join. It's free for everyone. Nobody's restricted from joining. Anybody can join, go to OIN's website and you can participate. And everybody signs the same deal, offering their patents up and this license to everybody else and receiving the same back. The, the companies involved are wide ranging, lots of automotive, mobile companies, uh, tech companies, but much, much broader these days, fashion houses, recruitment consultants, all sorts of companies who use or develop technology that's open. Um, and we at Canonical actually became one of the funders who pay for the infrastructure along with the initial founders, uh, Sony, NEC Philips, IBM, Red Hat and Navelle, Suze. Um, we have a couple of new funders, Google and Nissan, and also as well as Canonical, TomTom Tom was an associate member. So back in the day at Canonical, I sat on the board, but when I left, I made a, a conscious decision that I wanted to keep that involvement that the work OIM does is really important to me and to our community. Anybody who either creates, distributes, or uses open source software ought to be a licensee of OIM. 
Uh, the only reason not to be frankly is that you want to be a pound aggressor. And if you've seen the recent Gnome litigation, which um, uh, OIN supported the Gnome Foundation when they were attacked by uh, the Rothschild patent uh, non-practicing entity or troll, um, you'll see what happens when the open source community is really taken on on the patent front. And of course, uh, the, the victory that Gnome Foundation had was amazing. And they not only got a patent license for themselves, but for the whole open source community, covering all the patents held by the, the Rothschild non-practicing entity. So one of the, the things that I work on is OIN. I also have a couple of other formal roles. I sit on the Open Projects Advisory Council at the OASIS um, Standards Body. And I guess possibly the meat, the essence of this talk today, I'm the chair of the UN's Innovation Labs Open Source and Intellectual Property Advisory. And I'll talk a little bit more in some detail about that. Just a couple of final things about projects I'm involved with. Um, I'm the editor of a book, second edition of a book, and it's called Free and Open Source Software, Law Policy and Practice. Um, that book is pretty much involving or involves almost everybody who works at a, a well-known level in governance, legal compliance, policy, communities, or a lot of those folk in any event. Uh, to create 23 chapters guiding you through how to manage open projects and issues around open. Um, I'm really proud of the fact that the Veach Foundation have given us funding, which means that the book will be open access. Now, originally it was going to be published this year and we've pushed it back because of the pandemic. It will be published in January. I hope I'll get to actually meet many of you face to face at FOSDEM next year and we'll be launching the book formally at FOSDEM. Fingers crossed it will take place and we'll all be in Brussels. And then I guess finally, my final sort of open role is things like this. I spend a lot of my time talking to people in the open communities and writing about open source. Um, I have a piece coming out in BCS today, which talks about the track and trace apps. Any of you who've seen anything I've done recently will know that I've been following the track and trace apps, pushing for them to be open sourced and making sure that those are, uh, a way for us to find out how they've been open sourced, uh, licensing, etc., across Europe and beyond. So, uh, until the UN's Technology and Innovation Labs, um, Deb, Nina, can one of you hit the presentation, please? The link. <laughs> The fourth industrial revolution has changed virtually every industry in the last decade. And now it's time to apply that change to deliver on UN mandates. Moving humanity forward faster by focusing on the use of innovative technology is critical to reach the UN goals. The goal of UNTIL is to function as a startup environment and create a platform for collaborative problem solving between UN resources, academia, the private sector, and civil society. Each lab will link this platform with innovators from across the globe and facilitate the global exchanges of ideas and resources. To solve some of the humanity's most pressing needs, the UNTIL labs will use cutting edge technology such as blockchain, artificial intelligence, Internet of Things, FinTech, and drugs. With locations in Europe, Africa, Asia, and more planned in other parts of the world, each lab will focus on specific thematic areas. In Finland, for example, the first state-of-the-art until lab focuses on peace and security, education, health, and circular economy. It's situated at the center of a vibrant startup hub within the Alta University campus in Espo. The Global Antil Network is planning multiple collaborative projects to help the member states in progressing the UN mandate in the areas of peace and security, international law, humanitarian affairs, human rights, and sustainable development. All labs will support one another, sharing their information and experiments and communicating successes and learnings. The labs will invent, they will incubate 
and they will accelerate technology-based products and services that would address problems and find optimal solutions. We are convinced that this new global initiative will help us lift multitudes of people out of poverty, achieve the sustainable development goals, and enable developing countries to advance into a better future. So thank you. The way the social develop the, the labs work is through the sustainable development goals. And those meet the needs of society without compromising the future. They meet today's needs without compromising our future. To meet sustainable development, we need to, today not to compromise tomorrow. It's critical. To allow sustainable development to come from organized practices. And that these are based on a shared blueprint for peace and prosperity for people on the planet. The 17 goals are a call for action from all countries. They recognise ending poverty and deprivation, that these must go hand in hand with improving health and education, that we need to spur the economies and reduce climate change. Probably never been more important than it is at this time as we come out of lockdown and deal with the, the outputs of the pandemic. And the aim of these goals, the economic goals, is to meet the UN's 2030 agenda and to make it a reality. And that agenda is pretty much a, a summary of the UN's goals for the people, for the planet and prosperity. And they aim to do it through ownership from all stakeholders to make it a reality. Now, the Sustainable Development Goals also work with nine digital principles. If you look on my slide down to the right in the middle, you'll see that uh, there's a definition there for, or a, a principle there, which is to use open standards, open data, open source and open innovation. Uh, that open source can probably mean software or hardware. And frankly, it's another definition of this open technology phrase that I started off with, showing you that it's been used other places. Now these were developed, these nine uh, principles, to address failures in development of technology in international organisations and to allow sharing best practices and the use of ICT tools in international development. The unified, the, the unified principles were pulled together over time across a number of organisations and the unified work that was done by UNICEF, the World Health, or Health Organisation, the World Bank and the um, the Lynn Melinda Gates Foundation. So absolutely critical to the work that UNTIL does. And UNTIL's philosophy is that when technology succeeds in solving a problem in our lives, it becomes invisible. The ticking of a clock, so constant as to fade into the background, but too often we begin to take this transformative force for granted. But technology is not by its nature an inclusive phenomenon. Its availability in every context cannot be assumed, and as the clock ticks on unnoticed, lives are lost. I don't think there's much that can sum up the importance of technology being in, open, open to us all more than that. And you'll see there are already four labs across the globe and another half dozen or more planned in different countries. So I was approached just over a year ago to create the OS and IP advisory group. And to give you some context, we work on a wide array of projects from the four labs. Those have included to date a blockchain land registry for Afghanistan, a platform that measures charities impacts, gamification of literacy in the 21st century and maternal health for parents. Pretty wide ranging and there's a whole raft more projects that we've worked on. So the group that we pulled together are primarily in Europe, although we do have members in Asia and the US. Um, the group is mandated to maintain a framework that enables UNTIL to foster shareable or open technologies and catalyze the creation of digital solutions to build interoperable solutions that can scale across member states. Um, it's really important to me that as many of the projects as possible are open and by default they will be. Um, I would say this is a bit of a motley crew. This is not my wording. This is, I should probably realize, the UN's wording. And we are a group, according to them, of renowned experts in the legal and technology innovation fields. Uh, I'm not going to read it all out to you, but this group of people, um, actually a few of them are based in Germany and definitely known to you. So you probably all know Mirko. You'll know Isabel Dross from, from Apache, and Frank Kolischek, the founder of Nextcloud. 
so it's not just lawyers it's not just policy people you know we have community people we have people running open um companies or companies that use open economists uh policy people all sorts involved in this group and that the purpose is very much for us to get a, a broad community and a broad understanding from that grassroots base into the projects but it's not just this small group that can work on the until projects we have the ability to contribute as individual members of communities by contributing to the projects being run out of the labs. And you can see more details of those individual projects on the website. The UN is also in process of building a fellowship program that will allow internships for individuals with sponsorship from companies so that they can join on a pro bono basis to work in the labs and something I would recommend strongly. So why does this matter? I care about open source not just being good software. I care about open projects not just being good projects but being used for good. But why would anybody else care? Well, he cares, I care. Um, but you could say, of course, those two would care. They work in open, that's all they do. Let's think about it practically. So from a coding perspective, it's really important that when projects are being built on these in, in these international organizations on the basis that they've got to be scalable across countries, that they're going to um, allow access to the code and that we can see that that code is secure before it's rolled out and scaled. It's critical um, both to keep the, the member states and the governmental and supranational organizations honest but also for us to be able to contribute fix bugs uh, it's easier to meet compliance requirements the, the code will be interoperable it can be visible we can work with it across different projects it also allows as codes rolled out country by country particularly in developing countries for them to engage and i'll talk more about that later because it is a very important thing but as it becomes scalable within country they're able to learn how to code, learn how to contribute, and learn how to be part of a, a project themselves. So that collaboration in country means that it's not just a fix for the problem or a scratch for an itch, as Linus would say, but actually encourages ownership of a project at the local level. You may be familiar with the phrase, give a man a fish and you've given him a meal. Give a, uh, teach a man to fish and you'll feed him for life. And that's pretty much what these projects allow us to do. Um, we should all use open technology wherever we can and that is something that even a company like Microsoft today would agree with. So we've not just seen these international organisations pay lip service and start to move towards it, but we've seen at the essence of business, major companies, some of whom really did not like open source to start with, making that mind shift. And I guess we have to wonder why and how that happened. And if you've seen me speak before, you'll know I use this slide a lot. Um, so this is a very squishy picture. It's not, not very flattering for my poor friend, Steve Wally, but my friend Steve Wally was presenting at the Open Source Summit at the Linux Foundation in Edinburgh in 2018. In fact, he was keynoting it. And he was keynoting it along with Keith Bergel of OIN, the CEO of OIN, one after the other, because Microsoft had just signed up to OIN. You'll remember I mentioned OIN, you get access to Microsoft's patents to the extent they read an open source if you uh, become part of OIN. And what Steve was explaining was the journey that Microsoft had been on and how a company that 20 years ago, 10 years ago, hated open very publicly, a company with a CEO who described open source as a cancer, can move to the slide that you see now in this picture of Sasha Nadal asking to be judged by Microsoft's actions of today. Uh, actions where, at least according to GitHub, Microsoft is now the biggest single contributor to open source in the world. So where did that come from? Well, Steve would tell you it's three things. 10 years ago, clients didn't ask Microsoft for open source. Today they do. Clearly money counts. Obviously that makes perfect sense. I mentioned already the change when I was at Canonical, where we saw open move from the desktop, et cetera, into the, the platform and cloud environment. In fact, I'm doing a talk in two weeks' time, two weeks today, about, uh, I think it's called, uh, it's, it, I know what it's called, it's my talk, it's open under the cloud. So that talk um, looks at the different technologies and how the, the platform economy would not exist without open. And Microsoft have acknowledged that. 
for them to be able to work in platform services, they have to be able to understand and use open technology. Therefore, they have to be pro-open. And finally, the third reason is the development community, particularly those born since 1989, the year the, the Linux kernel uh, was created. Those people have grown up with open as a norm and those developers expect nothing but open. They, they, they don't see anything strange, unusual or revolutionary about it. They just know it's the best way to make code. So they want to work in that open collaborative way. And if that's good enough for a uh, big business like Microsoft, it should be good enough for uh, supranational organizations, charities, other ways that we do good using technology today. I just wanted to change tack slightly and talk a little bit about another experience I had. I, I worked for 18 months, maybe two years, based out of Amsterdam uh, for a company called Vion. It used to be called Vimpocom. If any of you are based in Russia, Ukraine, Pakistan, Algeria, Bangladesh, or across um, the central, uh, across uh, CIS, uh, you will know Vimpocom, or across the stand, you'll know Vimpocom. It trades, Vion trades under various brands with this B-like uh, logo. So you'll know B-line if you're in uh, Russia and you'll know Mobilink, the brand I've used here if you're in Pakistan. And I was sent out to Pakistan for work a couple of times, which is absolutely fascinating. And um, this picture was taken in a souk in a market in a modern building, I think it's in G4 in Islamabad. And if you went into the souk, you suddenly felt transformed back in time. You know, it was uh, fragrant with the smells of spices, vibrant with the colours of fabrics and ceramics in an array of colours. Really felt, uh, you know, like we were back several hundred years ago until you came to a corner with this little shop. And this little shop had uh, stickers across it from all the major mobile networks in Pakistan. And you'll see here, sitting on the counter, a biometrics machine. Now, these two gentlemen were excessively proud of that biometrics machine. Um, Pakistan has biometrics for all its nationals, a national database. And this gentleman polished the machine for several minutes before I was allowed to take this picture. And in the store, there were a queue of people, each of them holding a wad of cash, their ID, and a photocopy of their ID. And as they came to the counter, they'd hand over the cash, they would use the biometrics, to have their fingers printed and for them to be checked and the prepared pre-prepared um copy of their id would go into a, a little book as a, a receipt they'd hand over the cash and within seconds the joys of technology that cash would be transferred somewhere else across the world sometimes to uh in the particular case of the gentleman i was speaking to in the queue in the line um to his father who was a sheep farmer in the mountains of pakistan and his father was going to be able to collect from the local trader. There wasn't even a shop in his village. The trader would likely be there once a week on a street corner, selling whatever vegetable was in season, possibly tomatoes that week, along with handing out cash or uh, phone credits that had been received via these digital transactions. So you were able to cash out. Now, that is probably a bit interesting, but what's really interesting about it is that in this Pakistan and in many of these other countries, there was a huge population without access to financial services, without access to a bank account, no bank cards, no ability to borrow money. And these digital infrastructures being built through mobile phone networks were allowing access to financial inclusion for many, many impoverished people. I think the start in um, 2020 is, it may have changed because of the pandemic, but I think the start uh, at the start of the pandemic, the stat was 1.9 billion people across the globe still living in poverty and a need for um, them to receive financial uh, services, however that was going to be, but with the ability to skip ahead of those of us in the West with our bank structures. And that was great. And I was really proud of the work we were doing there because I felt we were doing something useful. But there was one problem with it. It wasn't open source. And what I discovered in the last five years is that banking has moved to open source. Projects um, or organisations like the Wim Melinda Gates Foundation and the World Council of Credit Unions have led the way in that. The Gates Foundation have recently spun off uh, the Mojolik Foundation. I'd recommend anybody interested in fintech take a look at this. It's an open source payment platform, which has actually been rolled out already in uh, Ivory Coast and Tanzania. 
doing exactly what the, the structures that we were talking about, I was talking about before in Pakistan was doing. You can see some more information about it there and I would recommend you take a look at that site. But what's happened here is that to create this financial inclusion, there have been five pillars of financial change where open has been used for good. And those um, are around the fact that it needs to be accessible by all which open is. It needs to meet or exceed the convenience of cost and utility of cash, which, of course, digital financial services can do. It needs to be open to drive competition and open innovation that expands the services offered on a sustainable model. And it's very, very scalable across developing countries. Now, just before I wrap up, I'm conscious that I've taken up a lot of your time today and you may have some questions I want to chat. Um, I want to talk about one last Open for Good initiative that I'm involved with, and this is very recent. Um, I have a, a, a certain opinion of the open source community, so it was no surprise to me when we went into lockdown that talking to others in our community, I was constantly being told about great new projects that people were spinning up. Projects that would uh, create open ventilators, respirators, try to help people with financial problems, create educational platforms, etc. But what I found very quickly that as we were talking about projects, I was seeing duplication of these projects across different countries. And I was on a call talking about OSPOs of all things with a chap called Jacob Green at mosslabs.io. And um, we were talking about OSPOs, but Moss Labs had come out of the uh, John Hopkins University, which of course many of you will know is the, the home of the coronavirus dashboard, the dashboard that's become the, the base point for all of our understanding of um, tracking the pandemic. So obviously Jacob and I both had a strong interest in what was happening across the open communities. And we realized that there was this duplication. We were seeing it different places. And we knew that there was a need to pull people together and create a space where we could find out about each other's projects. So what we did was uh, Jacob initially created a Slack workspace, which then had a Riot uh, layer built onto it so that we've got an open source uh, offering as well. And that was just a place for people to come into different channels and talk about the work they were doing on specific areas or projects, to make other projects aware of their projects, to let people know if they needed help. Um, I'll give you a couple of examples. So we shared uh, across a number of projects working on open ventilators, this article that was published in the Journal of Open Law Technology and Society, Jolts, called Breathe In, Breathe Out. And this article helps to explain how to use an open hardware license on a ventilator, an open ventilator. We shared a NASA project from the Jet Propulsion Lab there, which was for a 3D printed respirator and which was also uh, available on an open license. And we're taking that now, as of today, one step further. So I'm sort of giving you a preview of a press release that will go out tomorrow. By tomorrow morning, if you look up opentechresponse.com, you will find that as well as our GitHub uh, area, we also have a website, very small website, really a landing page. That landing page will give you a few things. You'll be able to pick up this lovely I support open tech response uh, as a widget with the website embedded in it. You'll be able to volunteer either as a project or as an individual looking for a project to work with in response to COVID-19. So it will be a matchmaking service that will allow us to put volunteers and projects together. And that's been spun out by the Open Teams project. I'm really grateful to them for picking it up. When we started to work out the kind of tools that would help the communities work together to remove silos and improve collaboration globally, um, uh, Patrick McFadden of Datastax was one of the people getting involved in building this out, and he pointed out that we should think beyond COVID-19. Um, I don't like being the voice of doom and gloom and didn't want to be the person saying, and when we have our next disaster, but when we have our next disaster, we're ready for it. We have these tools in place to help the open tech communities spin out their solutions fast and to collaborate and be aware of what each other's doing and also to match make. So if any of you are interested, whether it's as a developer, somebody does documentation, governance, whatever your bag is, if you're interested in volunteering, Go to opentechresponse.com tomorrow morning onwards and you will be able to follow the links through to register as a volunteer. 
or to register your project that needs volunteering if you need help. Um, and with that, I sort of get to the end of my presentation, roughly on time, I think. Um, I'm going to leave it now to Deb to bring me back to whether or not we have any questions from the audience. Great. Thank you, Amanda, for sharing some of the amazing work that you have been doing and uh, the many interesting initiatives around open source. Uh, so uh, for everyone, please ask your questions in the Slack channel studio. Uh, we still have like five minutes for a few questions. There is, a, so to start, there is a question from Isabel who uh, clearly we are impressed by what you're doing with Open UK. So the question is like, is, are there any plans to extend the initiative to other countries, to Germany, the EU, for instance? It's interesting. Um, it, it's very flattering and I would be very happy to work with anybody. We've been approached by a couple of countries and we've been having a conversation with Jacobs Green's OSPO project on the basis that it, it would make sense because Open UK seems to have come together well to take some of the things that we've done and replicate them and share. So we will look at building a country specific OSPO, making us a sort of open source program office for countries and offering that model to anybody who wants it. I wouldn't presume that everybody should use what we've done. It just seems to have worked quite well. Um, and we're happy to share everything that we're doing is available on an open license and, you know, uh, take it, run with it if you want to do some of the stuff that's there. It sort of makes me smile because the first time I was asked to be involved in Open UK, I said no, I wasn't interested in a country specific organisation. And um, I was persuaded otherwise largely because of Brexit. So it's a little bit ironic that I wanted to make sure we didn't get cut adrift and to make sure that our community knew each other so we could keep engaging internationally, that now we've got other countries talking to us about whether we can help them. Um, I'd be really keen if anybody in any country um, is interested in the kids competition, I'd uh, the, uh, the kids course rather, I I'd really be keen to talk to you because we have the script, all we need to do is create a translation and have a voiceover done and you have this brilliant 10 episode series. It was developed by a guy called David Whale who is an award winning tech educationalist um, and we have a company called uh, Drawnalism who created our branding for Open UK. They've done all the animation and it's really fun. Great, thanks. Uh, I hope that answers your question, Isabel. I, I guess you anyway know Isabel, she will reach out to you, but thanks. I think it's quite interesting how we can extend it to other countries. And um, so I don't see any other questions, maybe just a question from, Okay, so we have another question uh, from Getin, who would like to know, do you know of initiatives in the UK public sector to promote open source? So this is UK specific. Yeah, yeah. So I know uh, it depends on what you, you, you want from me, uh, what my, my answer should be. So I may be giving you the wrong answer here. I mentioned the Ditto project, Developing the Open, which is a IUK funded project for the NHS. Um, there is a report coming out probably next week from OSOR, the observatory in Europe. It's currently with Open UK's legal and policy group. And we're doing some updating for them and collaborating with them on that. I think it has about 10 initiatives listed and we will add a couple more to that. Uh, I don't know whether you're aware of the work NHSX is doing, but NHSX their policy is to release on an open basis. Uh, I guess there's some restrictions around that. And they released at least the front end of our track and tra trace app on that basis. But we do intend to be doing a lot more work with the public sector to try to see more engagement and to ensure that more projects are public. Uh, you can contact us at hello at openuk.uk if you want to, you know, to, to work with us on any of that, we're really open to everybody. I should have said that there, there is a, a way of paying to engage with Open UK, but that's not our goal. Our goal is for it to be open to everybody and anybody can participate. You don't, there's no cost to that. So if you would like to get involved, please ping us. 
Great, makes sense. Uh, so, I, unfortunately, we are running a bit out of time. So, thanks Sorry, again. Sorry, Deb, I talk too much, as you know. No, no, thanks. It was, as I told you before, I think there are quite a few initiatives I'm personally interested in as well. So, we'll follow up. And uh, for everyone else, please, uh, if you want to continue the conversation with Amanda, please proceed to the breakout room, VBuzz One. And Deb, just before we go, I want to say congratulations to the team who put this conference together. I think Berlin Buzzwords is the only event I know that's actually happening roughly on the dates that it was meant to, despite the pandemic. So well done, everybody. Congrats. Indeed. Thanks, Amanda. See you around. Thank you.